definition, we can say that, uh, that uh, epilepsy is a group of uh, central nervous system disorders that are characterized by several uh, outcomes. Uh, the main, the most important one, which actually impairs the patients a lot, is tonic clonic seizures. As we know, we have a tonic phase, which is contraction of our muscles, uh, followed by a relaxation phase. And then we have a clonic phase, which is a repeated uh, contraction, relaxation um, uh, series of movements. Uh, can, of, of course, affect the sensory system, the vegetative system, and also the psyche of the patient. Let's look one second at the uh, current distribution of the epileptic patients in the world. It's very interesting to see that actually the highest concentration is in uh, Central and South Africa, as you can see. As just to give you some number, it affects about 43 million people in the world. So it's, we're talking about something pretty stunning. Uh, and uh, um, by data from 2005 World Health, Health Organization, we have that 85% of these people uh, belong to developing countries, or countries that uh, are basically low income. Uh, the average that we can calculate is that uh, the average in the world is 8.93 people every 1,000, so it can vary from 7.99 to 9.50. Um, so, uh, we can classify the seizures according to their clinical manifestation and the type of electrical discharges. As uh, I was telling you before, uh, epileptic attacks may be also uh, once in a lifetime, and especially uh, children and elderly uh, go um, and undergo to um, one epileptic seizure in life. 5-10% of cases, so um, it's pretty high percentage, but that doesn't mean they're epileptic patients. Uh, the chronic pathology is what really uh, interests us, and uh, uh, if we analyze the common causes for the chronic pathology, it might be uh, mostly uh, traumatic brain injury is one of the biggest uh, points uh, uh, for future epilepsy congenital malformations or genetic factors, uh, but what we're going to probably talk more about that is the metabolic disorders that can generate uh, epileptic uh, seizures. Um, also tumors, of, of course, are very important because some, some kind of neoplasis in tumors can generate uh, the onset of seizures at some point in life. Uh, the B classification of uh, uh, seizure of crisis uh, is the partial and generalized. So the partial crises are uh, uh, classified according to uh, the uh, reaction after, of the patients after the seizures. So we have a simple um, partial crise, which is uh, a simple diffusion or electrical discharge that doesn't affect the consciousness. In fact, the patient is totally aware, is, is awake. And when an example of EEG is shown on the left. Now we have the complex, which is basically a uh, when uh, the seizure departs uh, from a specific locus and uh, spreads out bilaterally and in involving uh, the unconsciousness of the person at this point. Now we have secondary generalized seizures, which basically is a simple seizure, simple uh, partial price, that ends up in a generalized seizure, tonic-clonic uh, ground mal seizures, which is the one on the right. So the generalized crises are the ones that uh, affect both hemispheres of our brain. Uh, I divide, first of all, the tonic clonic seizures, which affect about 30% of patients. So we have, as we were uh, saying before, uh, tonic uh, onset. So we have a tonic contraction of, uh, of the body, of the uh, skeletal muscles. We have 15, 30 seconds of this contraction that is followed by relaxation. So the patient falls down, and after about uh, 30 seconds, he starts with a period of 60 seconds, 120 seconds, so 120 minutes of tonic clonic seizures. Uh, when he wakes up, he doesn't remember anything because he loses consciousness, as we said. And he bites his tongue, his cheeks, mm, my, uh, my pee uh, sometimes. And uh, there are many problems related to the fall, per se. There are apes, uh, absent seizures, uh, which is uh, also known as petit mal. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically uh, when the patient is still unconscious, but uh, 
the uh, epileptic attack is, uh, is quicker, uh, can start in childhood, and uh, is usually uh, associated with learning troubles. And we have myoclonic seizures in which uh, the patients have myoclonic spasms, uh, but only a few part of the, a very small part of the population is affected by that. And then the atonic seizure uh, are those in which the patient is walking and he loses his tonic muscle, uh, the, the, sorry, the muscle tone. He falls down, and if he's sitting, you will see the patient bend over. Uh, what's the pharmacological classic treatment for epilepsy? Well, we have a large spectrum of molecule that you probably are familiar with. The most known is probably carbonazepine uh, for partial crisis, uh, but we also have phenobarbital, uh, lamotrigine, phenytoin, very, very known uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, actually. So uh, for generalized crisis, we have clonazepam, valparate, which is also in common with myotonic seizures. What we have to remember is that the patient that takes this medicines, once it starts for epileptic uh, uh, seizures, he will take this medicines for life. There is no return. Also, we have to keep in mind that the status epileptic, which is a remitting seizure, remitting, sorry, seizure uh, longer than 30 minutes, a particular uh, status of uh, uh, epilepsy, we have to keep uh, the patient under cardiovascular and respiratory control. Um, we have to know exactly how they're doing from this point of view. Uh, also, the diazepam, uh, we have to keep in mind, it can depress the respiration. So if the patient is already, um, has already progressed problems from the respiratory point of view, it cannot administer uh, this, uh, this compound. Uh, phenobarbital is good for patients who are, who are refractory to other uh, um, medicines. So basically, when they are pharmacoresistant, uh, phenobarbital is the common uh, therapy. And finally, uh, lorazepam and lidocaine are known to be uh, an analog of diazepam, but longer effect. And here we come, why we want to treat these pathologies from a metabolic point of view. Because this, all the anti-epileptic drugs come, and all of them, come with sometimes struggling uh, side effects. The big one is the teratogenicity. Uh, if uh, administered while the mother is pregnant, it can cause spina bifida. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. It's spinal bifida. Spinal yeah. bifida. Spinal yeah. bifida. Um, and uh, so we always have to monitor the doses. That doesn't mean that the mother, a black mother, has to be left on her own. I mean, she has to be treated no, no matter what, but has to be monitored much more. Uh, the suspension of, this, of the anti drugs can be mm, terrible for the patients. Why? Simply because, uh, especially with the barbiturates and benzodiazepines, uh, can, uh, can cause, uh, again, seizure when we stop taking them. And an overdose um, is the other big problem. As we said, like, especially diazepam is respiratory depressant. So if we also have an alcoholic patient, we have association of problems. Minor side effects can be subjective or drug dependent. And the subjective ones are excessive bleeding, uh, fever, um, can be just pain, food intolerances, insomnia, or drug dependent. The, the dose, as we said, as when we decrease the dose, we have, again, see them. Mike will explain exactly what happened when he stopped his uh, anti epileptic drugs at the beginning before starting the metabolic therapy. Uh, can also come with nausea, a change of mood, um, and also walking in impairment. So this other part of the talk is basically what we found in, uh, in our lab in terms of uh, in vivo uh, data with rats. Not really in an epilepsy model, but in something very similar, which is known as central nervous system oxygen toxicity, uh, which outcome is uh, manifested by uh, grand mal type uh, epileptic seizures. So, the initial project from uh, um, my PI, Dr. Dean, um, was to find a, a pattern of respiration that preceded the onset of seizure because. Since this is a Navy project, a project that fund, uh, sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, they were interested in understanding if there was a way to predict seizures underwater. Now, how did seizures underwater happen? When we increase the percentage of oxygen breathing at pressure, we give the brain an overdose, based essentially, essentially of oxygen, which can lead to onset of seizures. 
Um, what uh, was found in 2004 by Dr. Dean and uh, Dr. Malki uh, was that uh, neurons in the brainstem area, which is uh, in particular the nucleus attractus solitaris, a respiration integration area, were very highly sensitive to bursts, as you can see here on the uh, right uh, graph, highly sensitive to bursts of uh, hyperbaric oxygen um, uh, shots. So basically, they also found out that neurons that were highly responsive to hyperbaric oxygen were also highly responsive to carbon dioxide, which led them to consider that probably hyperbaric oxygen would work um, via the central chemoreception as well as uh, carbon dioxide. Also, uh, a work from Beaker and colleagues found out that basically the more oxygen we administer the subjects, the more uh, his uh, hyperventilation will, will be enhanced. So if we give them, for instance, 75% of oxygen, he will breathe faster and more deeply. Uh, this, uh, in particular, this specific phenomenon is important in isocapnic conditions, so if we keep the CO2 constant. So what we wanted to do, and what we did actually with this project, was to integrate these findings uh, in an in vivo model. So what we did, oh, sorry. What we did, we uh, implanted our animals and dived and doped them in an hyperbaric chamber until they had seizures. So for those who are not familiar to what uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity can cause in terms of seizure, this is a video that will show you how uh, these patients can have seizures. So this is a, um, an, uh, a hyperbaric chamber and um, this is a um, Air Force operation at 2.8 atmospheres. The subject on the left was breathing pure oxygen at 2.8 atmospheres, whereas the physician on the right is breathing pure, uh, just regular air. The subject is telling the physician, I feel dizzy, I feel bad, so the physician let him lay down, and as you can see in a few seconds, if you observe his legs, he will have a classic tonic-clonic ground mouth type seizure, if you observe his legs. This is it right now. This uh, phenomenon in this specific case lasted about uh, three minutes, at the end of which the subject didn't remember anything. So actually we have the same outcome of a regular ground molecular seizure. So what did we do in order to monitor this uh, kind of phenomenon in our rats? We implanted our animals with uh, uh, radio telemetry devices that you can see on the top right. Uh, these telemetry devices allow us to record in real time electroencephalogram, electromyogram from diaphragm muscle, electrocardiogram, core body temperature, and physical activity. So these modules are able to communicate and to transmit data to the receiver that you can see in the black box. And we compress at this point in the chamber the five atmospheres in air and oxygen. Now, the reason why we compress the uh, them in oxygen, of course, is because we want to increase the percentage of oxygen. So we limited the amount of oxygen that we were giving the animal at the, that cylinder that you can see there. And this is the profile that they went through. So we kept them at the beginning for recording some baseline at sea level. Then we compressed the chamber, uh, well, then we gave them pure oxygen and compressed the chamber. And we waited, we measured the time, the latency to seizure, that they needed to uh, undergo to seizures, basically. And uh, now you might ask, how does a rat look like when he sees it? So this is during the resting period. He's just chilling out in the little cylinder, the little chamber. He's curious, he's, he wanders. I mean, he's, he's free to move around. He um, uh, doesn't have big space, but still. Whereas when he sees this, he will assume the classic uh, posture, which is the rat sitting on his uh, posterior paws. Now he's having tonic uh, attacks, as you can see there. See so the spasmal forelimbs and head. This is the way a rat sees it, and it is very uh, um, constant. We could observe this in now over probably 350 dives. It might change a bit. It might be more severe, less severe, but in, let's say in most of cases, it is the way they, they look like when they see it. So uh, we wanted to approach uh, the the epileptic attack, so the uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity from the body problem. Dr. D'Agostino came uh, out with the idea, why don't we try uh, the uh, ketogenic diet approach? Of course, the ketogenic diet is a little bit hard to, to follow, as you know. It's, you know, compliance ketogenic diet, as you probably know, 
is a, a diet that is uh, low or absent carbohydrates and increases the content of fats and uh, proteins are actually the, the regular amount. And uh, this, uh, since the early 20s, uh, was found to be a very effective therapy for uh, children epilepsy. And uh, the mechanism through which it works is that it allows our body to have alternative sources of energy, which are the kingdom bodies, that uh, are responsible for the reduction of reactive oxygen species, free radicals that are responsible for uh, our seizures, increase in acetone, which is an potent anti-convulsant, and uh, um, increase the energy reserves, the energy um, metabolism, the metabolism for the brain. Uh, so we we couldn't give the animal a ketogenic diet at first. So uh, Dr. Diagostino, uh, with the help of the chemist, uh, synthesized the product, the ketonester, a non-ionized precursor of a ketone bodies that would basically mimic uh, a ketogenic diet in a pill and uh, would deliver, would mimic the same conditions of ketosis of a ketogenic diet in about 30 minutes. So we administered our animals uh, with um, uh, with this compound about 30 minutes before that. But let's, um, let's focus now on the 